My name is Claire Colburn, and I'm the chair of the Belmont uh, Library Building Committee. Uh, just excited to get started, so I jumped right in. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to talk tonight about where we are right now. This is where we are. Okay. <laughs> we're at the end of the life of a building that has has uh, worked very well for us in the community. Okay, we are 10th in the state of all usership. That includes Boston Public Library, the Cambridge Public Library, Quincy, I mean, huge communities, and we are 10 in that community with this infrastructure, okay, with, with stairs that are being used now as a bike rack, uh, with electrical systems that are a little concerning, uh, and, and building systems that are at the end of their life. So what this means is they will need to be replaced soon or we're building a new library. And guess which way we're going. <laughs> we're going to do it. Uh, we are going to talk about also uh, where we've been. Uh, this is this is how well we use this library. We have over 300 programs a year that get incredible support from the community that serve our community, tailored to our community. These are our guiding principles. The, the committee established these uh, as a framework of how do we, uh, how do we what do we want in our new library? It's going to be accessible to all. It's going to be a gathering place for the whole community. Have a wide variety of resources, flexible and dedicated spaces that fit our interests, that are right-sized for what we want in our community, and that are able to be changed when the times change. It's going to be reflective of our sustainability goals. And it's going to integrate the landscape with the interior and have great views to the exterior and connect back to the town. I should also say that we've had a very collaborative effort with all the stakeholders, the immediate stakeholders, the historic society, the uh, watershed of Belmont, sustainable Belmont, uh, the Garden Club. Who am I forgetting, Kathy? Veterans, thank you. Very important. So, I said that one. Uh, so, it's, it's, we're just, we're gathering all this information from everyone, we've given it to the architects, and they're implementing into their drawings. Um, this is where we are tonight. We are on the eve of town meeting. We're unveiling schematic design. We've had a feasibility study that has has told us the way that we, the most prudent way to move forward is to build a new library, not to renovate. That would be too costly and it would not yield the spaces that we need. And lastly, we've been collaborating with our architects and their design team. And they're here to tell you a little bit more about the design. Thank you, Claire. Uh, my name is Conrad Ello with Odin's Ello Architecture. I assume everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Um, and with me tonight, I have Noel Murphy from my office, Odin's Ello Architecture. He'll, he'll be helping with the presentation. And Glenn Valentine from uh, Stimson Associates, the landscape architects on our team. Uh, Glenn is a Belmont resident as well and uh, very, very excited and passionate about Wellington Brook, which is figuring uh, prominently in our in our design. So with that, uh, we will take you through uh, the design effort. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what schematic design really means relative to a feasibility study that um, was was undertaken in 2017. So the schematic design process obviously builds on many, many years of, of work and discussion and community involvement that, that have come before uh, our efforts uh, on the project, um, but ne but at the beginning of this year, beginning of 2019, we really embarked on schematic design, uh, which is which is uh, 
a little bit more of a detailed development of a, of, of, of a real building design. It's, it's, it's unlike the feasibility study, which is very high level, it's very conceptual, and there were some designs that you looked at. The, the, the schematic design effort that we've been involved with is, um, is in fact, uh, has engineers, has cost estimators, has code, uh, code consultants looking at the project. So this is a detailed look. Having said that, um, it's still early in the process and it's still very malleable. So the designs may look quite finalized in, in the, the renderings that we share tonight. Um, there still is a lot of room for development and, and exploration as we get into the, the, the later phases. Uh, so just keep that in mind as, as, as you look at what we're, um, what we're sharing tonight. Um, I want to mention uh, a lot of things, I think Claire touched on a lot of these points, a lot of things have fed into this schematic design process. It's been 10 months, really, it's January to October. A normal schematic design process takes about three to four months. We've gone the extra mile to put a lot of time and effort, and this is a lot of time and effort fr from a lot of people, including the uh, folks in the community. Uh, so we've, it's been an extra, an extra special effort with schematic design, more than we normally would do on a, on a typical pro project. Uh, there's been bi-weekly meetings with the Library Building Committee. There's been meetings with the staff. Um, I think Claire pointed out some of the focus group meetings with uh, a number of constituents or, or stakeholders. Uh, we've met with the ta town agencies, a number of people in town, to get their feedback, the fire chief, the police chief, uh, Steve Dorrance, I think you might be here tonight, facilities, director of facilities in town. Um, we've also embarked or, or developed a, a, a net zero energy feasibility study. We've produced a construction cost estimate. Um, we've had, this will now be our third community meeting and we've done an online survey. So there's been a lot of things feeding into this, uh, this effort. And all of this has influenced what we have on paper here. It's not just a bunch of architects, you know, designing a building, you know, in a vacuum. This, is, this has really been a collaborative effort. Um, these are some images from the first community workshop in, uh, in, in March. Um, uh, they, they were very interactive, a lot of feedback, a lot of comments, a lot of sticky notes that we, we uh, took back and, and tried to incorporate. Uh, we heard a lot of things, uh, a lot more than, than's on this list here, but these are just some of the, you know, touching on a few of the, the more important ones. There was a, uh, a lot of interest in more collaborative, kind of quiet study working spaces or, or uh, study spaces in the library spaces that you don't currently have in this building. Uh, an overwhelming support for keeping the children's room on the ground floor, which is something that works quite well in this building. Um, Excitement about having the main entrance level at the street level along Concord Avenue, so not up, you know, climbing a berm to get to that front door, which is, which is, uh, it, you know, makes the building kind of standoffish and a little bit more of a, a challenge to get into. A um, lot of comments about wood and brick and trying to make this building uh, tie to the kind of history of, of, of Belmont. There's a great uh, brick. Uh, making uh, tradition here in Belmont, and there's a lot of great municipal buildings made out of brick. Uh, an overwhelming uh, enthusiasm for engaging Wellington Brook that might uh, be in part uh, given uh, Glenn's energy to try to promote that, but that's really been a, a driving force behind our interest in creating some indoor-outdoor connections between the building. Um, and then uh, one also very important point is, is the strong interest in the net zero energy uh, outcome, or at least uh, striving and uh, trying our best to, 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 to achieve that. And we, we'll talk a little bit more about that later tonight. Um, we've got some, uh, uh, some thoughts about that. Uh, so one of the earliest diagrams we, we did was, this is actually a, an excerpt from our, uh, our interview presentation, which was just some initial thoughts about the, the project. Turns out that these ideas have really uh, uh, germinated and kind of stayed uh, true to the, the, the f foundations of this design. And it's really to take this site, which uh, is challenging in many respects. You know, it's not a big parcel, so parking is kind of an, is, it, is, you know, it's limited by the, by the boundaries of the site. We've got, it's, it's a very wet site. There's a lot of, um, you know, water with a high water table and, and Wellington Brook there. Uh, but we, we weren't daunted by these, these challenges. It was, it was more, boy, this is an exciting site along 
Concord Avenue, if you imagine the, the, a new library in combination with a new high school being sort of a de facto gateway for, for the town of Belmont, I think it's, it's quite exciting in that respect. It's also exciting to think of this library site in the context of the Underwood property next door, the Underwood lawn, the Underwood pool. Um, right now, it's separated from the library site by a kind of scrawny scrim of, of trees, but boy, what an opportunity to try to have a new library engage um, that property and have that be a new edge. Um, and also, how can we take this property which, and this library, which is currently <laughs> surrounded by asphalt uh, parking and drive lanes, and, and try to reconfigure that parking, that vehicular access, in a way that allows the building to connect to the site more directly and to, to open up connections to Wellington Brook, which is a great asset uh, in the back of the property. So this has kind of dri uh, sort of been a, a guiding diagram for us as we've moved forward. This is some images of the, uh, as I said, the bermed, the raised entrance. Um, the library is, is pushed back from, from Concord Avenue as well and surrounded, as I said, by asphalt. This is that scrim of trees uh, separating the, the, the library property from, from Underwood Lawn. And then this great asset, which, which Glenn will talk more about, uh, behind the library, which is, again, it's separated from the library by virtue or by way of the, uh, the drive lane, lane that surrounds the building. But this is, um, this is an asset that's right there. So with that, um, preamble, I'll, I'll, I'll walk through uh, really what is our, our new final uh, schematic design. Um, this is a, a kind of a cutaway plan with Concord Avenue here, uh, Underwood Lawn, and then Wellington Brook and some of the, the woodland behind. Um, relative to the existing library, this is the existing library footprint, about 13,500 square feet. Uh, you can see it's held back from Concord Avenue. Our new uh, library moves closer to Concord Avenue and expands to be about a, a, a almost 21,000 square foot footprint. The, the total building area of the new building is 41,500 square feet on two floors. Primarily, there's a mechanical uh, uh, third floor level mechanical and storage, but uh, primarily on two floors. Uh, and what's great about this expanded uh, library is that by pushing it closer to Concord Avenue and also closer to the Underwood property, we're able to maintain the exact number of parking stalls on the property and still gain this bigger uh, footprint. So that's, that's a real win. We didn't lose any parking, but we've expanded the building by almost, uh, what, 30 or 40 percent. Uh, so zooming in a little bit, and I'll walk you through uh, the various spaces. Um, the entry of the building is on um, the northwest uh, corner of the building, so it has presence on Concord Avenue, and it also has presence as you approach from the, the parking area, which largely stays where it is currently, but it's reconfigured, and some of the spaces that we're losing on this side of the building, on the east side of the building, will get rolled into a new lot on the west side. Um, there'll be a book drop. Uh, hopefully a, um, a way to honor that, that uh, the veterans. There's a, a, a great memorial, as you all know, in the, in the lobby of the existing library. This will be a new uh, veterans memorial that will be along the entry wall uh, coming into the library that allows for any kind of veteran celebrations to occur when the library is closed. That's one of the things we heard from the Veterans Committee is that they can't access that memorial uh, for celebrations when, you know, on, on, a, on a holiday because the, the library is closed. So this will allow them to do, um, to have events uh, and honor the veterans in a way that's more accessible after hours, but, but you know, outside as well. Uh, that entry leads into an area that we've been calling a library commons. It's really the heart of the building. Uh, it's an area where you'll have a welcome desk. Uh, all the circulation desk operations will occur there. There'll be new book material. There'll be comfortable places to sit. Um, and it, as I said, it's really the heart of the, of the library. And so it connects um, all of the other spaces of the library to, to this, this main central uh, room. Um, this is an image of that. Uh, this is essentially the view one might get when they enter in the front door. Uh, so it's a, a dramatic space, uh, very um, open both to Concord Avenue, so uh, as one is passing by in a car, they'll see kind of the activity and the energy in that space from the street, but
but then it also has great uh, uh, visibility and views back to uh, the woodland uh, uh, edge on, on the south edge of the property. And we'll talk about some of these features in that space a little bit later, but as, as I mentioned, it's, it's really the area where new materials and, and, and orientation really occurs. Uh, in addition to the commons, uh, to the east of that is, is a whole new children's wing. This is, uh, again, on the ground floor. We have planned in stroller parking. There'll be uh, a, a dedicated st uh, stroller area, which is great. No elevators for, for kids and strollers to have to navigate. Um, what's great about this wing is it has uh, a dedicated children's story time and craft room. Uh, it's, that's an amenity. Uh, you don't really have here now. I think you, you use the flat room, which is a meeting room, in part to do some of that activity, but this will be totally dedicated to, uh, to children's activities. And then there's even a, a controlled, secured outdoor area for, for children for, for play and activity that's directly adjacent to that craft room, so that there's some reciprocity there between those two rooms. Uh, but that'll be part of a controlled uh, experience for, for, uh, for children and their families. This is a view of that, uh, that children's wing. Um, again, views uh, out of the building. In this case, the, it'll be along the east side of the building, will be views out onto the Underwood lawn. Uh, in addition to children's, coming around the commons, uh, there's really a meeting wing, uh, which is uh, f uh, featured within is, is a 150-person community uh, multi-purpose meeting room. Uh, and then another room that's similar to the current flat room here in, in, the, in the library that's uh, a room for about 20 to, to 30 people, uh, but gives a second uh, flexible meeting space. Uh, what's interesting uh, here is that there's a, a, an after hours entrance into the library that allows uh, the town to access these two important meeting spaces uh, while the library is closed. So these can become great uh, kind of town amenities for, for all sorts of events that one might have here. Um, this is a, a view of, of the main uh, community room, uh, directly adjacent to the library commons and also uh, with great visibility again to the, to the green spaces to the south of the building. Uh, what's wonderful about a space like this is, it, you know, you, you have a big event there, you can spill out into that library commons and have, uh, you know, a reception out in that great hall, or you can spill out onto a terrace, a garden terrace. So there's great flexibility in how one might use that space uh, relative to receptions that might be uh, tied to an event. Um, in addition to the meeting, there's a, a staff and support area. This is um, inclusive of uh, uh, a friend's store, there'll be a, a friend's kind of book sale store and, a, and an area for friend's donations and friend's processing of their um, whole collection. Uh, there'll be um, uh, a whole host of, of staff and support spaces. Uh, this uh, after hours entrance will also serve as a staff entrance and a delivery entrance so that that, that kind of activity doesn't get mucked up in the, in the, in the main entrance uh, on the street. Um, going back to the uh, commons and then leading us upstairs, there's, there's one kind of featured element that we have in the, in the library common. It's the, the central stair element, which is more than a stair. It's really a seat stair element. This is something that um, we had shared with the community, I think, as early as the May meeting. There were a lot of comments about it being too big, taking up too much room. We listened. We've made it smaller. Uh, but we still feel like this is a dynamic element. Uh, that not only serves to be the required um, main stair up to the second floor where the adults uh, collection is, uh, but it offers a kind of gathering spot for folks in uh, the library common. We're, we're finding more and more that libraries are becoming the de facto community centers of their communities, and this is you know, part of that ability to gather uh, folks and, and to create these opportunities for informal exchanges with, with neighbors. Um, so that's this, um, you know, th this is the stair portion of the, of the seat stair, and then there's a, a kind of a stadium seating. So also, if you imagine these new book carols being in, on, on casters and they move out of the way, that you could have a great movie night in here. This can become also uh, an event space in and of itself. So it offers yet another kind of communal 
a space for, uh, for gatherings and events. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Noel. Thanks, Conrad. Um, so now we're going to move around the kind of the outside of the building, um, just like you got a tour of the interior spaces, kind of show you um, kind of the approach to uh, the exterior of the building. Um, this is a view uh, looking at the entrance here with the young adult space hanging over it. Um, Concord Ave on the left hand side of the image to orient you and Wellington Brook to the right um, and all of the parking consolidated on one side of the building. Uh, the material palette for the building is you know, fairly simple in our mind, um, but, but well considered. Um, a combination of brick and glass primarily, brick being the predominant material. Um, and the, the taller section of the building, that central volume, um, using a, a wood-like panel material that complements the warmth of the brick. Um, and then in terms of the glazing, there's kind of a combination of punched openings, which correspond to staff office spaces and smaller rooms in the building, and then larger openings that correspond to the larger public rooms in the building. This is a view looking across uh, Concord Avenue, roughly from the, the gas station across the street. So this does kind of allude to a, a nicer uh, treatment of, of the lot across the street. Um, <laughs> but but what's, what you can see um, most clearly is um, this very transparent space in the center of the building that aligns with the Library Commons. It provides views from front to back from Concord Ave Avenue all the way through to Wellington Brook and the gardens behind the building. Um, and so that's a very kind of important feature of how we're thinking of the facade, you know, what's solid and, wh and what is glazing. Um, the, for, for reference, the height of the main volume of the building is about 28 feet, um, which, as it compares to the current library, the, the ridge line of the roof of the current library is, is 30 feet. Um, so the building's not getting much taller um, along the street edge, but we do have the taller volume set back, um, which bumps up a bit higher so we can bring daylight deeper into the building. And there's some more images that show that. Um, we're very influenced by the history of brick making here in Belmont, and there's still evidence of that down the street at Clay Pit Pond. Um, and also the, the heritage of um, brick in the municipal architecture of the town, um, including the original library building, this current library building, and I think we're very interested in, in the new building participating in that legacy. Um, and, you know, both looking back in terms of what you can learn from these buildings, but also looking forward and how would you use a material like brick in a contemporary setting um, with the latest advances in building technology, uh, but always hearkening back to what we think are kind of the, um, you know, the, the most important structures in Belmont. And I know the high school has taken a similar kind of point of reference uh, with these buildings. So we want to also, also be consistent with that where we can. Uh, one of the most exciting aspects of the new building, which Conrad alluded to, was um, the way that the building opens onto Underwood Lawn. Now um, there's a fence and a scrim of trees here. If those are removed, uh, the building gets to take advantage of this open space. Um, even though it's not part of the library site proper, it gives kind of a, a point of relief for the building. It makes the site feel much larger than it, it actually is. Um, and the upper, upper section of the building actually gestures out towards um, the Underwood Lawn um, and in, incorporates an outdoor reading porch. So it would be a covered outdoor space accessible from the adult reading room um, and a space given where it's located in the building, it's secure. You could easily take a book or a magazine out without having to, to check it out. Um, so you can freely move in and out uh, from that outdoor space. This is a view stepping inside the building, um, looking out across that outdoor reading porch space. This is at the far end of the building, uh, you know, as far away as you can be from the library commons, and really a great opportunity to have soft seating and quieter spaces um, for more kind of individual activity and contemplative kind of the experiences um, that many people want in the library. Um, this is a cross section cutting all the way through the center of the building uh, with the Underwood lawn here to the left to orient you. 
Uh, this is the adult read or the outdoor reading porch with the view, uh, which we were looking at j just a moment ago. Um, and then tracking through the building, you can see the library commons, which is really a space uh, that's tall that links um, all of the other ends of the building in, in terms of light, in terms of uh, views. Um, and so the moment you arrive, you can orient yourself to where you are um, and where the various spaces in the building are that you may want to go to. This is a cross section cutting the other way with Concord Avenue to the left uh, and the Wellington Brook just off the page to the right. Um, again, you can see the height of that library common space. Um, and from a uh, kind of a performance standpoint, one of the things that was um, behind the thinking of this, of this space and having it be tall is because the building is so broad, it's a very wide building, um, raising the roof here and introducing clear story windows allows a lot of natural daylight to come down into that space um, and make it very inviting instead of being a, a kind of a dark space in the center of the building. Um, and then the, uh, off of Concord Avenue, um, you know, the, the, the interior spaces are really kind of an extension of the sidewalk. So as you're walking past the building, you're, even if you're not feeling invited inside at that moment, um, you're kind of participating in the life of the building. Um, and on the opposite side, the community room overlooks um, some of the garden spaces that Glenn will talk about and, and the brook. Um, so there's a really nice indoor-outdoor connection when you're um, attending an event in the community room. If we zoom out a little bit and look at the building in sight together, we can highlight some of the sustainable uh, features of the building. And we've really thought of this holistically, not simply in terms of uh, building performance or energy use, but also um, you know, expanded that to, to think about what's the interior environment like? What are the qualities that make it a place that you want to be? Um, what are the opportunities um, with the exterior spaces and the landscape to encourage movement and activity and, and make people want to use those spaces? Um, so I'll, I'll touch on a, f a few of these, um, beginning with kind of the more performance-oriented ones. Um, we've been focused on finding the most efficient building systems um, so that the building can operate um, at, you know, without using a tremendous amount of energy and also in a, as a cost savings measure. Um, coupled with that is how we think about the building envelope. Um, so what types of insulation and things are we using around the perimeter of the building um, so that when the space is cooled, the, the, the temperature is stable. If it's, if it's heated, the temperature is stable so that the building systems aren't working extra hard um, you know, over the course of a day or between seasons. Um, I mentioned previously the daylight, uh, introducing lots of daylight deep into the space. Uh, Conrad had mentioned using uh, that high roof uh, for, for PV panels to generate um, solar energy. On the back side of the building, there's, there's a whole host of things that we're doing with the landscape to um, manage and treat stormwater on site. Um, we've done everything we can to reduce the amount of um, impervious surface. Um, and, and Glenn will speak to that more, but we're trying to filter all of the stormwater on site. Now it runs straight into, into the brook. So there's a big improvement there. And also um, how we treat the, the banks of the brook, trying to reintroduce native species and making that a more welcoming environment and a teaching environment. Um, related to many of those um, topics, um, uh, was a, a zero net en energy analysis that we undertook um, kind of uh, one third of the way through the process uh, with the design team and the building committee to look at the feasibility of a zero net energy library on this site. Um, and we looked at um, three things in, in particular as part of this study. The first was at, at, in any kind of analysis of sustainability of a building is how do we reduce um, the energy demand in the building? Uh, how do we limit the loads um, required to keep that building running? Um, so that may include things like using daylighting instead of electric lighting to cut down on your electrical loads. Um, highly insulated building envelope is another example of how we can think about really the most efficient building in terms of um, reducing loads. 
Second is the building systems. Um, thinking of building systems that will operate efficiently and, and not oversizing them. Um, and one of the conclusions that we had as a team was that this building would, would use all electric uh, mechanical systems, um, which are, are both energy efficient and also use no fossil fuels, um, which is probably the most exciting aspect of that. Um, and that's really kind of a, uh, a necessity if you're, if you're trying to achieve a net zero building. Um, and then uh, kind of the, the final point that we spent time on, uh, on was how can we generate elect or energy on site? Um, are there opportunities for renewable energy? Um, and, and yes, there are. And the one that uh, was the most um, uh, efficient was, was the PV panels. Um, so as Conrad said, I think we can maybe in future, future phases of the project study, maybe enlarging the amount of photovoltaic panels um, that we have on the project. But that's our main source of on-site renewable energy. Um, and taking all of those together, we've been able to um, you know, come up with a very efficient design, we think, in terms of how the building operates. Um, it's a net zero ready building um, by virtue of its all electric uh, mechanical systems. Um, we think we can generate about 35 to 40% of the energy needs on site. To get to a true net zero building um, where you're generating all of the energy you need to operate the building using renewable sources, we'd have to look at off-site renewables. Um, and so that's something that I think we'll take a closer look at as the project moves along um, in, in the future phases. And now I will um, hand it to Glenn to uh, discuss the landscape. Okay. Thank you, Noah. So, as Conrad mentioned, I've been a Belmont resident for about 20 years now, and I never really even noticed Wellington Brook. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have that same reaction, but it's very hard to see. It's down four feet below the level of the site. It's kind of, I think, in people's minds, this ditch. But when you go down and you get a little bit closer to the level of the water, it's really quite beautiful, quite stunning. Even in the middle of winter, it's, it's really a remarkable stream and resource for the town that's almost completely hidden. So uh, one other thing about Wellington Brook is it more than just being hidden on this side, throughout the town, it used to stretch from one end of the town to the other as a natural stream corridor through Belmont, and now it's almost completely culverted underground. There's only about a quarter mile of it above ground that's daylighted and only 200 yards of that are on public property and that's the land that's on the library right now that's the the area of the stream that flows through the library property so it's really paramount that we take advantage of this resource here and make sure that it's recognized that it's appreciated and as much as possible restored to ecological health so that's kind of been our motivation at least from a landscape standpoint from day one on the project Here's the plan, the uh, final schematic plan that we have. I'm not going to go into detail on this plan about the individual pieces, but I'll get to those in just a second. The main thing I want to point out here is what the whole team has been talking about throughout this presentation is how much the transformation of right now, as you well know, there's a loop road that goes all the way around the site. That's a lot of asphalt that's doing nothing but moving cars around. And by consolidating all the parking on the west side, we keep that same 42 spaces, but radically transform the entire relationship on the south side of the site. You have 60 feet, 70 feet um, in some areas on the south side, and gives us the opportunity to change the orientation and relationship of the building to Wellington Brook. And really, we've envisioned it now as a series of garden spaces, or even more, you might call it linear park. They will be open 24 7 and really enhance the library, but almost stand alone from the library at times when the library is closed. We're, we're thinking of people walking through this and really enjoying it throughout the years, throughout the year on the weekends, et cetera, um, and really creating another park space for the town. 
We've also really taken pains to integrate the building into the site by taking advantage of the very different adjacent conditions all the way around the site. As has been mentioned on Concord Ave, we're really creating a civic plaza where that Veterans Memorial will be located and you have on-grade ADA access, you'll have areas for uh, you have um, <laughs> access to the entrance and we see I, I come here to vote so that's a perfect place right now it's kind of awkward you kind of stand right on the corner now you have a place to stand <laughs> and support your favorite candidate here uh, going to the east this green terrace there's been a we've seen a lot of images of the views over this space the idea that there would be a kind of space to rest on the ground plane as well, a kind of green terrace overlooking the Underwood lawn, we think is uh, beautiful. And we've thought of a lot of ways to develop that. And we've worked with the Garden Club on this Woodland Garden, which is one of the real treasures of Belmont to make sure that we maintain it as is right now. And all of that work that's gone into it is protected and maintained. But really, we extend it in a very exciting way of thinking of a, a pathway that runs into this linear garden along the south side is really an extension of the woodland garden as a teaching tool in a new uh, riparian en environment. In the parking lot, we've colored this blue on this diagram, which might seem a little strange. We have Wellington Brook Corridor in the parking lot in that. The reason we've done that is it's imperative that people understand that this parking lot is part of the Wellington Brook watershed. And that water right now on the parking lot flows directly into Wellington Brook. All the pollutants and everything just sluice through these openings at the edge of the parking lot. We're developing stormwater gardens to make, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second, but really make that very apparent and very clear to people that this parking lot is part of the Wellington Brook watershed. And lastly, but not leastly, this big arrow. This has been um, the driving force in the architecture design. You've seen the images from Concord Ave going right through the building. Uh, beautiful windows so you can see the brook from Concord Ave and we've taken that up but also with linear gardens and walkways this green terrace linear stormwater gardens to really draw people through the site and make Wellington Brook as much an evident resource on Concord Ave as it is when you're walking along the edge of the stream this zooms in a little bit more to some of the pieces and parts of the site plan First, I'll point out there's two stormwater gardens. There's really one related to the parking lot itself and one related to the building. The water that comes off the parking lot is very different. It's quite dirty. It has oil and other salts and things in that um, first inch of runoff that you need to treat. And we've developed a stormwater garden, a series of kind of stepped terraces right here that will pick up that water and cleanse it, pick up some of the heavy metals and infiltrate it before it goes into Wellington Brook. And we also have a boardwalk which gets you down to the edge of the brook and this isn't water you want to interact with but you want to see it, you want to be aware of it. So that is part of the experience and that's part of the uh, awareness of how this building and this parking lot re relates to Wellington Brook. The second system is much more related to the building. This is kind of the clean stormwater system. This is water that primarily comes off the roof of the building. And it runs from all the way from Concord Avenue, Co Concord Avenue all the way through the site down to an interactive stormwater garden in this linear park before it finally gets into Wellington Brook. And we envision this space back here as a real teaching tool for kids and for educators in Belmont to explain how stormwater works. We see kind of stepping stones going through this garden and water that's, that's quite clean, but how the, the buildings as, acting as a watershed is related to the brook and how water is taken up in wetlands in this very small kind of example garden. Then running along this southern landscape, um, this linear park is a series of outdoor garden rooms. And they relate very directly to the indoor programming, as, as Conrad was mentioning. We have this events terrace here, which is right next to this big community room. In the interior space, we see people spilling out on that, have a little uh, seat wall around it, and a small grove of trees. Children's enclosed reading area, which is very informal, kind of playful space, but protected and controlled. And out of a... <coughs> This area here is another reading lawn out of this south entry, which will be open at times. And 
this is where uh, an area where fire trucks need to get access. They need to be able to pull that far in. So we needed a lawn area there, but we see that doubling as another lunch area or reading area directly off the main uh, common. And then this is really one of our, our favorite spaces, this outdoor classroom or gathering area, which is right off the children's wing and also off the common. And it's, it's thought of as a performance space or gathering space right on the edge of Wellington Brook. Here's an aerial perspective that gives a little bit of the character of that space. It's going to be very natural, very much like a woodland flowing through here. We're maintain, maintaining all of the wonderful existing canopy trees, including the Don Redwood over here, and tulip trees, and cornice moss. And we're going to supplement that with other native trees, some more canopy trees, and understory trees and shrubs, native plants, all of them that will provide habitat and year-round winter interest through berries and some um, other kind of evergreen ink berry, uh, fiber, ink <coughs> berries and other kind of plants along that space. The amount of lawn that's here now is kind of deceptive. It, you wouldn't think there's much lawn here at all, but there's actually quite a bit, Peter can attest to, that has to be mowed uh, by people here at the <laughs> library. So we've done our best to reduce that. There's two small lawn areas. This reading lawn I mentioned and that outdoor street side amphitheater there. So it's cut the amount of lawn in half. The rest of the area will be native grasses and ferns and sedges, which only need to be cut down once a year. So we've really been thinking very carefully about maintenance of this space. It's completely different from the woodland garden, which is very precious, little collections of different plants. Here we're envisioning much more uh, simplified kind of planting that can be more easily maintained. And here's an image of that stream side amphitheater, which we're really excited about. We, one thing that's important to know about this, it steps down about two feet from the current level of the bank now, and, and that's really important. That first image that I showed, where you really can appreciate Wellington Brook, you're right down at that, almost the level of the water, just a couple feet above it. But by stepping down to the level of the water a little bit, not all the way down, but about halfway down, all of a sudden you have views of the water, the sound of Wellington Brook on the riffles going next to you is very strong and apparent. And you understand and you see this as a resource whenever you're in the space. We envision this as a place for um, outdoor classrooms, um, children coming out here for reading groups, maybe even an author, maybe even musical performances could happen back here. Or very likely just a place to come out of lunch for people from the town to come through this space and it's, it's at a level where we even see this may flood occasionally. We've designed it in such a way that this can take up some flood water and help to deal with the issues of more severe flooding by creating more capacity where we can in this area and making people aware of the way the environment is changing and how we have to change to address that. But most importantly, I think it's just the idea that you have this natural resource that is completely hidden now. We want to make it part of everyone's everyday experience. You have this kind of wild, natural environment that becomes part of everyone. I can see a lot of people just walking through here on a daily basis and all of a sudden having access to Wellington Brook. We're just really excited about that. So Claire's going to get up and talk a little bit now about some more of the uh, budget and schedule. So what is it going to cost? <laughs> What is it going to cost? That's a question that Adam Dash, our select board liaison, has asked us how many times? Three years. <laughs> uh, and another number of other people. And, and we want to thank you for your patience. Because to get this building to be the right size, to be uh, catering to the right types of program, to be adjusting so that we have more collaborative uh, study spaces, to accommodate the additional grades that are coming into the high school slash seventh and eighth grade. You know, the pedagogy of learning has changed. Collaboration is how people learn now, kids learn especially. So we needed to add those spaces into the program. This is what it's gonna cost. $35 million, $200,000. What's changed from the feasibility study? 
A few things have changed. Uh, one is escalation. We now know, and that's con for construction costs. We now know a target date for when we're gonna have the town vote, and I'll speak to that in a minute. And so we've taken, uh, we've taken that cost of what it would cost to build it today and taken that out to uh, 2024 for construction. We've added the resiliency and the sustainability features that were asked for from the town, which is the prudent thing to do, knowing what we know about global warming and knowing what we know about our budget for operation costs. And we've added some of these program enhancements, not a lot, actually. Uh, the, the program has stayed right on point from the feasibility with the exception of a few of these spaces like the collaboration rooms. And that is really what makes up the difference. So what happens now? Now, between the time that we vote, November 2022, there'll be a fundraising phase that the foundation, the library foundation, will be spearheading. And where is David? <laughs> it's right in front of me. David Stiverter is gonna be amongst the rest of the foundation will be, will be raising those funds privately so that we can bring the cost down as much as possible to the taxpayers. It's an unusual uh, uh, possibility of potential in this town. Uh, we haven't had uh, that many fundraising campaigns on the scale of this one that this one's going to be. Uh, but they've been working diligently and uh, have an incredible set of resources in the members of the foundation who are organizing this campaign. A uh, skill set that is well beyond most of our reaches uh, doing major capital campaigns. So we are lucky to have you guys supporting the project. We also wanted to mention that uh, there, there are going to be questions that people have that they may not think of tonight. Uh, so we're going to be showing tours around the current library. We're going to be having uh, kind of office hours uh, throughout the next year and a half or so. Uh, the first two are listed here, December 10th and January 14th. We have a new website, the Belmont Library Project, where all of these documentations, all these images, the plans, uh, all the information resides. You can contact us there. And, uh, and we're open for, for questions now as well, but uh, feel free to reach out there as, and ask us any questions that you may have. Thank you. I also just want to point out that um, Chris Schaffner, who is with the Green Engineer, also a, a critical team member, was the uh, spearhead of the, the Net Zero study, is now here. Just came from class at Northeastern, so uh, uh, thank you for coming. We're lucky to have him on the team, and he's here to help us uh, answer any questions, especially any uh, related to the Net Zero push. So we're, it's open to questions if folks have any um, for, for any number of us. So. In the back. How tall are the ceilings, and is there an entrance over by the Underwood side? There is no entrance uh, over on the east side of the building along Underwood Lawn. There are a couple of uh, entry points uh, along the south side of the building. So there'll be a door from the children's craft room that can lead outside. That's a controlled door, so that wouldn't be able to be open from the outside, but a person in the library could, could control access. The same thing would be uh, there's a door out of the multi-purpose room spilling out onto the terrace. Uh, but there's no door on that, on that Underwood side. Yeah. The other question you had was tall of ceilings. Um, Noel, can you answer that question? I'm trying to think. Probably 10 and a half or 11 feet on both floors. Uh, obviously, the central space is quite a bit taller, as you saw in the images. But. Um, Gentleman with the yellow tie. You mentioned that we, we've not had too many fundraising campaigns at this scale. 
What were their previous ones? What were their goals? And were they successful? Mm -hmm. David, do you want to speak? Sure. Yeah. 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 So my name is David Stevader. Uh, you have to go in the yeah, mic. I'll go up front to the mic. Uh, and repeat the question. Claire introduced me just a second ago, but my name is David Stevader. Um, I'm president of the foundation board, uh, and we are spearheading the capital campaign, but we are by no means doing the capital campaign. There is an entire capital campaign uh, that will sit behind us. Uh, the question for those of you who weren't able to hear it is, uh, what are the other projects in this town that might be at this scale uh, that have been done before? And I think, was that, was that the question? Um, so the answer is there, there aren't any at this scale. Uh, we have had some private fundraising in town. The most prominent example that I'm aware of is the Beach Street Center. Uh, there are others in this room that probably know the numbers better than I do. I'm told that privately there was approximately a, a million dollars raised for that. I think that's roughly in the range. But that's, that is the project that is uh, you know, kind of the most money that, that was raised privately. I don't remember the entire budget for the project. The pool was the, I think, would probably be the next in line, uh, about four, four, 400,000 or so. Some of the money, I'm not sure if that includes what came from the Belmont Savings Bank Foundation. So half of it came from that. Um, so for this project, we would certainly also be looking to corporate uh, or foundation type uh, donors as well uh, as private uh, individual or individual foundation type donors. So we're really embarking on a, uh, a, new, a new venture for the town. Just one follow-up question. Have you uh, planned out a feasibility study for the fundraising? We haven't done a new feasibility study. There was one that was done, uh, I think, uh, you might have seen on some of the prior slides that there has been several efforts, have been several efforts in, in town uh, at a new library, one of which was back in the 2005-2006 time frame, which is really when the foundation first started. Uh, so there was a, feasibility, a fundraising feasibility study uh, done back in that time. Uh, we haven't done one since, and part of the reason for that is timing, um, that we don't really want to wait on fundraising to to finish the feasibility study. So effectively, we're going to be running a, a version of a fundraising feasibility study at the same time we're actually doing the fundraising, which is not unheard of. Uh, the key thing that we're looking towards is, as Claire mentioned, the date of uh, November or presumably November of uh, 2022. That would be the target uh, that there's been some discussion around and some, some unanimity around uh, for a, a town vote for a debt exclusion for the amount that we don't raise uh, privately. With that, I'm going to turn it back uh, over to the yeah, library yeah, expert. We've done we've done a fair amount of research uh, into that. Uh, excuse me. Oh, to repeat the question: Have we done any? Uh, have we looked at other libraries uh, and costs of other libraries to see how it compares or stacks up uh, up to what we're we're presenting here tonight? I'll mention the 35.2 number is an all-in total project cost number. That's not a construction cost number. That's important to know it. And, encompasses everything from moving to temporary quarters for a library when it's under construction to legal fees to you name it. Um, everything is in that number. And we have looked at other projects, particularly in the Commonwealth, at their all-in number. And one example I'll give that's, I think, very relevant is the, uh, the Medford Public Library, which is currently under construction, just came in at just under 20 million construction, it's bid, it bid in 2019 dollars, but the total project cost there is, is 35 million in 2019 dollars, and it's a 44,000 square foot brand new library. So that gives you some context that in 2023, 2024, at 35.2 million, if anything, we're, you know, you could argue we're low, but, but I think we've done good homework. We've built in we, a level of conservatism that we feel uh, confident and comfortable with. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the features are, what's in their all-in number, but that gives you some a, a very good frame of reference. And there's other libraries that we've looked at as well in terms of cost per square foot that we, we seem to be in the, in the right ballpark. So this is not, one couldn't necessarily say this is a wildly extravagant kind of... 
No, it, it isn't. Um, it isn't, and it, I think we, we have built in some features that one could argue are, are extravagant, but I think they're important to this community, having to do with, um, with the net zero energy. For example, photovoltaics. We've, our, our firm has done a couple of projects where the town has committed and purchased a photovoltaic array as part of the new library project that they've done, but that's, that's not common. Um, but that is a premium that we're accepting and building into this, into this budget. In the back? Yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm, repeat the question, please. So, to repeat the question, um, what is a library today? It, it, it doesn't appear to be the library that we're, we were used to, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and and I'll, I'll just say it is no longer just a rep repository of books um, with a couple of rooms, meeting rooms, and a couple, maybe a director's office. It is truly. Uh, the libraries that we're seeing in the Commonwealth and the new ones that are being built, uh, ones that are being renovated, are more like a de facto community center. The, um, they offer, there's the, just the programming of libraries has expanded so much, but they are still libraries. They, I mean, to be clear, they, there's still books, there's still a need for that, there's still, I mean, you, uh, Peter, you can speak a little bit to circulation and, and how, how much that's an integral part of what you do here, but programming uh, is is there's so much that goes on in libraries today that probably didn't didn't occur 20, 20 years ago. They, they are gathering spots. They are community centers. Well, do a minute. I mean, it, it's still a library. Um, it still it still houses books. There's people still. Um, Somebody start a stopwatch. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Struzero, the director of the Belmont Public Library. Um, I think it's the living room of Belmont, really. I mean, I, I hear folks often ask me, well, what about the rise of the digital age? You know, where, where are libraries going to be in 10 years? FY19, which finished in, in uh, June of uh, earlier this year, was the biggest circulating year in this library's history. 150 years. It was, it, we had the most people through the door. We had over 800 meetings and programs and over 600,000 was our utilization number of, of the collection. So we said earlier that's 10th in the Commonwealth of like 371 libraries. It's nuts. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I stood uh, up here just about five years ago, or going on six years ago, at a microphone, and I said that I thought we could make the library the living room of the community. And what's your living room? It's whatever you need it to be. You know, it's where you have important discussions. It's where you entertain. It's where you meet with friends, where you meet with family. We do everything here. It's not just a place for books. But we're not going to get rid of all the books. Has that been a minute? Because I'll go. Okay. Uh -huh. Just picking up on that, could you say? Uh, yeah, I want to understand. It's not going to work. It's not the plan. <laughs> no, I was just wondering what you'd ask for in terms of book space for the library. I, I mean, I think we, what we've asked for is enough, enough book space to house what we have right now, though I know we're not going to need it. I know we have too many books in this library now because some of us can't get over getting rid of the books. Um, but whenever I have the state come out or any sort of uh, any sort of folks come out that, that look at libraries and look at what the, what the needs are and what the trends are now, they say, you have too many books here still. You know? So we try every, every, every month, every year, to chisel down that collection, because when we get this done, we're, we're not going to bring over every book that's not going to get used in the future. It doesn't pay uh, to spend taxpayer dollars to house these books that then are going to get gotten rid of. So um, I, I'm rambling a little bit, but does that answer your question? 
Yeah. No. <laughs> Your last part where you try to whittle it down for the last. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to whittle it down, but, but I, th I think that we probably have, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 140,000 books right now. I think that's too much, but I'm not going to chop it in half, you know, but we're going we're gonna to come down some so that we, if you look in here now, we're afterwards, when you guys look at the slides closer up, we have so many community spaces in the new library. Right now we have two. It, it, all in here, if you count all the quiet study rooms and so forth, there's like nine or 11. Um, so more space for people, more of that living room that I'm talking about than just shelves of books. Do you want to mention the Minuteman too, just that you're part of that? Yeah, yeah, we're part of the Minuteman Library Network, which is like the premier network in Massachusetts. It's about 45 libraries or so. Um, I, I'm on the executive board of that, that group, so we pay attention to the way that we, tr we share services there. And there's well over, you know, uh, many millions of, of items that we can share uh, throughout the network. So the need isn't, doesn't exist necessarily when the new bestseller comes out. Every library doesn't have to buy 10 copies of it like the old days, you know. We try to share resources as, mo as best as we can. Okay, please do. So the question was about uh, whether there might be a cafe in the library and then also uh, in conjunction with the, the community room, whether there would be uh, resources and accommodations for catering. Uh, and actually, you're, I think you're right to ask those two together because there's a potential overlap, right? Exactly. So cafe, uh, no, with hoods and flipping burgers, no, not like that food possibility there's 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 capability of doing that where could there be some some coffee could there be some pre-made sandwiches could there be some baked goods there is yeah. there is a capability of of that uh it has been a hot button topic in the past we want to use the space uh in the most uh, resourceful and respectful way, but I think having a space that could serve both, right, the, the catering aspect of the uh, community room for receptions, and then also provide some, some basic uh, food services. It's something we've talked about a lot, and, and we have space that could be, and you can yeah. speak to this more. So but I interject, we do actually have a catering kitchen in the plan, right. in the design that's associated with the community room itself. That's yeah. not necessarily the cafe or the right. food service component, but we do have a dedicated uh, catering kitchen. So I think we can handle events with caterers. Um, and as far as the cafe, I just want to mention that that came up in both community meetings, um, and there was really a lot of support, a lot of, a lot of, over, uh, a lot of people who said, well, we'd love to see a cafe. So mm -hmm. we're not against it, um, and I think we, we have the capability to maybe provide something, not, mm -hmm. not with the commercial, not a commercial kitchen, not the hoods that uh, Claire's saying, but with, we could accommodate that if yeah. the community wants to go that way. It's a relatively small amount of space that would be needed for that, that could be then repurposed for uh, storage or other needs as well. So it's it's you're not locking into an idea that uh, commits you uh, in a way in the future. Yeah, it's quite flexible. The kitchen thought because it's connected. I mean, you can mm -hmm. use that uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In the far back. Um, I was wondering about the parking. I came in a little late. How many spaces are you eliminating? Do you want to uh, So, the question was about parking um, and how many parking spots are we going to have with the current, with the, the proposed design. And 
Uh, I believe it's 42 uh, is the number. That's how many spots we have today, and we're, we're holding on to that number of spots. As I said before, we're expanding the building pretty uh, significantly, but we're able to, based on the way we've reconfigured things and limit, eliminated drive aisles, we've been able to uh, kind of consolidate all the parking and maintain that number. So we've got those 42 spots. Obviously, Concord Avenue provides a little bit of a relief valve as well. Um, there park, there's parking along there, and there, there's all sorts of ideas I know that are in the in the works or th are being thought about uh, on the north side of Concord Avenue, directly across the street from the, the library site. Whether those come to fruition, we don't know, but um, we're going to at least have the n number of spots we have today. Yeah, follow up on that. The parking we've we've had conversations uh, with the high school building committee as well as the uh, folks from the, the rink of ways we could strategize and create some parking that a number of entities could use. Uh, so they're not, we're not building sort of three times the amount of parking, but we're providing parking that would serve three different uses. So uh, lots of questions. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I just want to get a little more detail, uh, Glenn, about the uh, path that takes place between the Wellington Brook and the library. Sure. Um, is there a driveway still next to that, or is it just a path? It's just a path. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's just a path. It'd be, yeah, the, the question was, what's the nature of the pathway we're showing on the south side of the building between the building and the Wellington Brook? It's really, and the question was, is there going to be a roadway there, too? And the answer is no, it's not going to be a roadway. It's just going to be a pedestrian path. It's going to be a five-foot wide kind of standard width of a sidewalk, um, porous asphalt path, so it's going to be permeable but um, very resilient. Now, my further question is that as that path continues on the um, town property behind the um, library and, and the Wellington Brook. What happens at the end, at the beginning and end of that? Is that, for example, is going toward um, the Armenian Church and First Church, um, is that going to extend into the town-owned property along the Wellington Brook? Um, that's kind of a, a vision or a dream that we would we would love to have, and, and it ties into some discussions about the um, town path and, and larger network throughout the town, we'd love to have this not just be the 200 yards along the library and have it extend behind the Armenian Church and the Unitarian Church and over to the town common. But there's a lot of private property in there, and I don't even know if there's any town property uh, beyond where the library is. So we'd love to have it happen. It'd be a, it'd be a bigger movement for this, this idea of a linear park along Wellington Brook. This does tie into the Underwood. Network it does tie into the Underwood network of, of the, the playground and the uh, open space in the pool there. Uh, gentleman from the glasses, yes. Um, the um, middle and high school um, project has just reached the 90% um, construction document phase, and they are at a 22% glass to wall ratio. What is, is the glass to wall ratio for? Um, the glass to wall ratio currently is just under 40% now, I believe. And that was a bigger number um, when we met with the community uh, in March and May. You may have been part of those discussions. Certainly we heard uh, the concern about too much glass and we listened. We, we, we added uh, a lot more wall. We reduced the, the length of the clear story. Um, at, at the at the topmost level, and we brought that number under under um, forty percent. I think what's important, and, and Chris can speak uh, far better to this than I can, but I, I believe there's now new energy code requirements um, that uh, we meet uh, with this with this uh, smaller glazing. But I was hoping I was going to hang out in the back. <laughs> and but, uh... We'll let Chris. Uh, feel this because he's so good at it. He can talk a little bit about the building type as it relates to glazing. For yeah, so, um, you know, the interesting thing about a, a building is if we're trying to design it from just a, the thermal envelope perspective, it's going to look like a refrigerator. And it, 
Uh, if we're going to build it from a thermal envelope perspective, it's going to look like a refrigerator. And, and people don't want to go to school or go to the library or live in a refrigerator. So we're always balancing this idea of light and transparency against this idea of thermal insulation. And so there's a range that's an appropriate amount of glass for a building. And it depends a lot on the quality of the glass and the type of the uses in the building. Uh, our state energy code uh, sets a maximum for uh, glazing from a prescriptive approach. And for this type of building, that would be 40%. So we're below that number. We're going to be meeting and well exceeding uh, the state energy code. But you know, I think what we've got is a, is a scheme that balances uh, those needs for reducing loads against the, the other, the other uh, needs of the building as far as serving the, the users in the community and creating uh, light and an inviting space. And, and so I think that if we looked at changing that glazing amount a little bit, there's actually not a big energy penalty in there. Uh, you know, overall, it's a, it's a scheme that is fossil fuel free, uh, which, which puts us on the path to net zero. As, as we clean up the grid, we're not going to be burning fossil fuels here ever again. And that's great. Uh, and we've looked at this all with a, a life cycle perspective. So we did analysis and looked at different schemes for the amount of insulation, the different systems. What we've got is not you know, the absolute most aggressive approach, but one that has the best life cycle costs and fits with the needs of the building and the community, I think. Can I add two yeah, points to that? Uh, I want to add two points to that, which is this is a very different program building program than the school. So there's an auditorium, there's a pool, there are locker rooms, there, there are spaces that do not want glazing uh, on the exterior in that. There really are very few spaces here that that, that is the case. Uh, additionally, the, the library will, as well as being the living room, it creates a wellness factor for people, bringing people together uh, creating a connection, sort of biophilia response to the exterior, circadian rhythms, all things that come with having glazing. Uh, I think the architects have done a fantastic job of using that glazing judiciously. So where they have clear story glazing, that light is coming down through to the first floor. Uh, to me, that there it is a balance. Um, and we've heard those those concerns, and we've also heard the concerns for having and the interest in having those views, and we've reduced the glazing, and we're, we're meshing them together, so. And is there, is, is it still time in, in, in the process to re reduce that cost to the wall ratio anymore? Well, or is this kind of locked in at this point? This is the end of schematic design. Uh, when we have the town vote and we've raised the money and we're moving forward in design development, there's, there's still time, as, as uh, Noel pointed out, for making some changes. Uh, don't, and we're not looking to radically change that number at this point, uh, but there is some, some time to do some tweaking. This is not fixed in stone, that's correct. Who is doing the cost estimating for the 35 uh, the construction cost estimate was provided. Oh, sorry. The, the question was who provided the professional services for cost estimating for this project, for the $35.2 million. I'll mention that the construction cost estimate was provided by a company named A.M. Fogarty uh, out of Hingham. They do uh, a, a lot of um, municipal work throughout the Commonwealth and, and have priced countless libraries uh, that are, you know, in the current, current market. Yeah, so the all-in number was developed through, uh, you know, certainly the, the, a big piece of that was the A.M. Fogarty's construction cost estimate. Um, but we, we, got all, we did all sorts of research. A number of people weighed in to, to get us to, to, to arrive at that $35.2 million. And then you talked about uh, the wood, and I see it in the rendering on the third level of the building, encompassing, I guess it's mechanicals up there. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's it's a, it's a resin product. It's actually not wood, it's but it's not it's an exterior. It's no, it's not. Okay. It's not. Because we've been having quite a problem with IPay on the Wellington School. Now, yeah. That's an eleven-year-old building, yeah. and I had not been in that. I, I was on the Chenery Building Committee years ago, and I 
Yeah, and we we had heard of those same issues as well. Yeah. And the detailing inside, I mean, they've got things like a two and a half inch base, and where the corner bead and the drywall comes together and goes down to the floor, it's a real problem. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're aware of that project's and issues. Value engineering is currently going on, and what's been happening is a scramble at the 90% submittal to cut $19 million out of the building, and there's been a multi-million dollar cut prior to that. And uh, things that we're losing out on is a portion of the granite curbing on the outside, the granite base on the building is going to be precast concrete. It's going to be, instead of a standard brick, it's a jumbo brick with some metal cladding. Um, <coughs> the landscape planning has been assaulted, is the only way I can say that. Um, it's interesting you bring up, we're, we're talking about the high school project and, and where they are at 90% uh, CDs. The building, and it's, it's going to be the same situation. I mean, I yeah. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. We did, we, we, you know, we got the numbers as a group, the building committee, you know, everyone was thinking, boy, this is a big number and, and uh, we wanted to make sure it was sound and defensible. Um, but there was, you also want to make sure there's a level of conservatism built in. And we, we went, actually went through a value engineering exercise with the building committee to try to whittle that number down and ultimately decided you know, there are so many things that, uh, so many variables that attack a project over the course of its, um, its life. Yeah, we didn't, we ended up not taking those value engineering efforts for that very reason, because we wanted to make sure that we, we, we have the right number um, that we can move forward with. Our, our big concern, many of us, is that a lot of the materials are not quality materials. Like the, the entryway now went from a stone paver to porcelain tile, and now it's going to go to linoleum. I mean, simple things like yeah. that for the long term, the long haul, is make it a quality building. Yeah, it's important to have the right number so that you 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 address you address that you avoid those those kinds of decisions. Sorry, we we don't Kathy, we're running out of. Oh, sorry. Kathy. Can I just, it, it, it's Kathy Cohen, I'm chair of the library trustees, but also a member of the building committee. So one thing, and I've been working, I think, most closely with the historical society. The one piece not included in the 35.2 million is the movement costs and the temporary storage costs or temporary storage for the historical society. Um, we have, though, in, in parallel, been talking about a CPA funding. So there are some things within the current design, historical room, veterans, potentially the gardens, that could um, qualify for CPA funding. But because historical unique needs, um, they're where they would reside temporarily. So that is that piece is not in the 35, but I know the Historical Society is pursuing that uh, additionally. But just wanted to share that. Thanks. How much more time do we have? Um, there, I, there were a number of hands up before. I don't know if we've got more questions. Uh, gentlemen, the glasses. Sir, uh, as I'm sure you know, the uh, site for the new middle high school was raised, I think, by a foot. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that, uh, that uh, Underwood field filled you know, three, four feet of standing water, but that that happens uh, uh, somewhat regularly. I, I, I wonder if there are any concerns that the, or if, if you've raised the uh, site at all, or if you, or and if you not, if you have high confidence that it's going to be yeah. your floods coming every decade, that, that, uh, and, and being right on the banks of a, of a brook. Um, right. So the que the question has to do with ha did we consider the the floor level of the building relative to flooding or relative to the potential for flooding? Um, it's interesting. FEMA produce. Yeah, I'm sure a number of you know this. Produce. They have a whole map center where they produce floodplain maps. Usually, you're dealing with those kinds of maps with projects along the coast. But believe it or not, those FEMA maps do 
pick up parts of um, parts of Belmont and parts of Cambridge and Arlington, and it comes into some of these these waterways. And we looked at them carefully, um, and we do have a high degree of confidence that our first floor is above that floodplain. I don't know, maybe the high school is slightly at a slightly different elevation, but it's it's close. But we're we're in um, we're in good shape with uh, with the elevations. First of all, we're substantially higher than than the, the base elevation of Wellington Brook, uh, but we we also are protected from um, the the floodplain, uh, the kind of high water marks for hundred year floods. There is a little bit of a widening um, between, yeah, at at the at the library, especially at the entrance uh, point itself. So I wanted to tie that into the fact that there's a um, painted bicycle lane on Concord Ave that's reasonably heavily used. I I use it, <laughs> and uh, it would be nice if a lot of people got to the library on their bicycles. And I wonder if some of that space that you're um, giving over to the widened sidewalk actually could be um, used to widen or relocate the um, bicycle lane, let's say, in between the sidewalk and the uh, parking spots. I'm sure you're, you know, it's a good, it's a good, good thought. Question about the question had to do with bike lanes um, and whether or not the area directly in front of the building could um, maybe be reconfigured to accommodate uh, cyclists along Concord Ave. Um, we haven't, just to be clear, we haven't changed the, the, the bike lanes or the roads, the, 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 the parking along Concord Avenue all stays the same. So the curb line, everything out north of that is, is exactly, will remain exactly as it is now. But it is a good question. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth thinking about. I'm a cyclist too. I, I use those kinds of bike lanes all the time. It'd be great to, to do what you're saying, let's say, like accommodate bike lanes in a different way, in a safer manner, in that zone between the curb and the building. Yeah. But it doesn't work if it's just 300 feet. Right. And then it's right. got to go back out onto the street. If anything, that creates a more dangerous right. situation. If it were part of a larger initiative, I'd totally be in support of that. So, um, sorry. The, uh, well. Yes, actually, that is part of a much larger initiative, because the people who are looking at the high school and the traffic and the student access to the high school are looking at ways to protect the bicyclists and are going to, I think, try to change Concord Avenue so that the parking is beyond the bike lane. Uh, and that would make it much safer for everybody, especially the students riding their bikes to school. So that is under study. That's great. Yeah. That's great. But I yeah. just wanted to ask one other question, sure. if I could. And that is about the gardens behind the library and so forth. And in the municipalities, have a hard time coming up with both people and money to take care of landscaping, as we all know. And so I guess the question is whether they uh, have thought about putting in plants and so forth that really don't require maintenance and don't grow too fast. So yeah, absolutely. Um, can, can you connect something with this? At what point of the project you will make decisions about those type of plants? I have a question. Like the grass, do you know about Paul's premium? So there, there is one thing. Uh, we start to make decisions from day one. Uh -huh. um, but I will send you an email. <laughs> please do. Um, but definitely, there's a very strong consideration about the maintenance of the planting, and it's it's quite simplified. And the plants that we're thinking of right now on the ground plane would be um, sedges, which are a kind of slow-growing native grass, and there's uh, strict. Uh, there's a uh, some that are very good in sun and some that are very good in shade. So we'd be using sedges, we'd be using um, some kind of panicums where we have these depressions, where we have the stormwater gardens, and we'd be using ferns. We've used a lot of um, hay-scented fern and um, marginal wood fern. We're doing this at a number of places around the city, actually, where we create these very simple large swaths, swaths of plants that can be maintained quite easily, uh, that grow slowly, and if they need maintenance there's a of course there's an establishment period where the weeding is going to be critical in the beginning but once they they get established right. they're very self-sustaining and really it's it's a once a year kind of cutting of those grasses but it's it's a consideration from day one and that we're thinking about you had your hand up first <laughs> um, my question is about the adult space and the 
relationship of the stairs, the community stairs, to the adult space. Many of the current users of the library have various degrees of mobility limitations, and I wondered um, about access to the second floor is one question, and the second question about safety of the stairs, and the third question is about noise mitigation resulting from that open stairway. All good, all good questions. Um, questions having to do with the adult space, uh, access to the second floor, um, the safety of the stair, and uh, acoustic no or noise mitigation between the open areas, the library commons, say, and, and the adult room. Um, first of all, the, the building is fully accessible. Uh, all uh, entranceways are wheelchair accessible, all doorways, all levels of the building. There's an, there's an elevator that serves um, the second floor and, and goes all the way up, as I mentioned before, to the mechanical floor. Um, so that the building is fully accessible, and that elevator does serve um, is in a, is in an obvious spot uh, connecting the library commons up to the to the, the adult level. The safety of the stair. Um, this is a code compliant stair. It'll meet all the requirements, the minimum state requirements. Uh, but for a, a grand stair like that, the, the the rise and the run of the stair, the, the the width of the tread and the height of the riser would probably be more generous than a, so it wouldn't meet like the code minimum. It would, it would probably be a shallower rise and a deeper tread, which is I think an easier stair to navigate if you, if you have any mobility issues, but it'll fully meet code. Um, the sound mitigation, it's a good question. Um, we've done some library projects that have had big open spaces like this that connect multiple floors. Uh, one of the most important things is how you handle your ceilings um, and making sure you have proper acoustic treatment in those ceilings. Um, we just did, if, if anyone knows, the Situate Town Library has a big open space like this with a double height space, and it's a fully acoustic ceiling that um, I think the acoustics in that space are quite, quite good. But keep in mind, this is a big library too, and so yes, the area immediately around the top of the stair might be a little noisier if there's a gathering on the seat stair or there's something going on down on the library commons first floor. But it doesn't take much to get away from that. I think uh, there was an image shown about over near the outdoor reading room at the, at the east, the far east end of the adult space that's completely separate from that. And I think that there won't be any uh, spill noise that far into the plan or that deep into the plan. And then there's all these uh, you know, collabor collaboration rooms or, or dedicated rooms that one can find nooks and crannies within the new library to get away from the busier parts of the library. But sometimes that, you know, that library commons, that dynamic social space, there's some energy there and, and we're not against, you know, it's not like an old library where everyone has to hush hush. It's, uh, you know, that area of the library commons will be a more dynamic uh, area. It's, it comes down to acoustic treatments more than anything. Excuse me? I'm a librarian by day as a VA, and um, we don't have any library space except in a few of our hospitals, but we work virtually. And so to this gentleman's question, I just wanted to say, book publishing, I just checked my data, book publishing hasn't gone down. Each year, more books are published, more print books are published. So rest assured. I work in the library. There you go. <laughs> We're all librarians at heart. But the, Book published, books are not going anywhere. Just look at the new bookstore in Belmont. Um, so the library, and I'm also a trustee of the, of the library too, and the books will be chosen carefully to be deaccessioned and chosen as we choose them carefully to bring them on board. So worry not. Now the one place that I think the children's area, uh, you want to keep up the things on the I think you're right. Oh yeah. We had a lot of discussions with the children's librarian about not having enough shelves in our plans uh, over the course of this schematic design, and I think we, she was finally satisfied, I think, the last time we, we talked to her. So I hope we have enough, enough shelving for her. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know. Yeah. You, you, you have the, the MBLC data. So. <laughs>
Hi, Peter Struzero, director of the library. Um, so no, at the moment there's not a grant. There's, oh, pardon me, the, the question was will we be getting any funding from the state? So um, it's a long answer, but I'm going to try to give you the highlights. Uh, at the moment there is no grant available. Uh, the last grant round still has 17 libraries on the waiting list that have all been approved. Those 17 libraries won't be completely funded until the year 2033. So there may, if, there, if, if the state were to get another uh, grant round funded and the bond cap lifted, which they've been trying to do for years so that they could build more each year, then there may be another grant round and it may be announced in 2028. And it may take place in 2029. And then the libraries that would be approved then may get funding beginning in the year 2034. So I think that the, f the beginning of this fund round started in 2017, keep me honest, and it will end in 2033. So then if there was another one and it started in 2034, when would it end? Uh, we represent one of the only communities in uh, the Commonwealth history to ever give back a grant twice. So I think it's safe, it's safe to bet that if we had to do it all over again, probably we, we could get approval, but it would probably be you know, 20 to 30 years from now, and we wouldn't be on the top quarter of the next list, you know? So we'd be talking about money somewhere in the 2040s. I don't wanna, I don't wanna do math that I'm not sure of, but if it's five, 6% escalation in the, in the total cost of the project, and we're talking about that many years from now, uh, that would not save the taxpayers of Belmont any money to wait and to go for a state grant. So the short answer, no, uh, we're not, but we're going to look for other grant opportunities. Uh, but at the moment, uh, there's not one available for Massachusetts. When you look at the design of the library and like what functions can support, are there any things that are unique to Belmont that inform your decision as to what, what to add and what not to add? Um, you know, I, I think that that history wing is is unique to Belmont. Certainly, um, it's not often you find a historical society asset that's embedded or yeah embedded in in the library. So that that piece in the Belmont room, I think there's some synergy there, like bringing those collections a little closer together and creating a whole wing. I think is is unique to Belmont and was is, is town specific, let's say, to this particular library. Is there anything else you can think of that? Yeah, I'd say uh, the Wellington Brook. The, well, the, the landscape, that, uh, certainly. Yeah, there are, there are a whole series of spaces that, working with Conrad, we've developed as spaces, though. So the program isn't just inside the building, but where you have a community room that faces the brook, you also have an outdoor terrace, so you can spill out onto that space. Or where you have the children's library, you also have the opportunity to come out into a streamside amphitheater kind of space where you can conduct programs. So that's very unique to Belmont. And I would say, I mean, the support for sustainability, while it exists in other towns, it's uh, it's it's very well supported here, and that's a that's a great thing to have that interest and that drive from coming from the community mm -hmm. uh, for those amenities and those features that are going to save the town money, to save energy, to be all electric, no fossil fuel fuels. That's a strong. Can I add one more? Not, not to belabor the point, but um, we're all unique to Belmont too. Uh, one of the one of the aspects about this building that came out really well is because we weren't able to get state funding in the past. The reason why those buildings never went forward was because the state of Massachusetts ran that design, and every time it came up to the public of Belmont, for one reason or another, it felt like the state designed it and Belmont didn't design it, and it wasn't the right building for Belmont. So this process, when I came on five, six years ago, I was asked what will be different about the next process, and I said that this was going to be a, a building that Belmont was going to design. Belmont was going to decide what the building was going to be, where it was going to be, how big it was going to be, and what it was going to be. So I think that that's, that, that's something uh, unique about it, because a lot of our colleagues do go the state route, and it ends up that they're, they're very strict guidelines that they have to follow. And uh, while we followed all the laws, Belmont designed the building, so the whole thing is pretty pretty unique to the community. Uh, <laughs> Sally's. Yeah, the question is about the, um, the, the, 
the proper terminology of the meeting room. I think we, I, I, okay. Yes, the large meeting room, the multi-purpose meeting room, the community room, the, they're all the same. It's a, the big meeting room in this new design. It can It's a very good question. Um, the, for, uh, the question about whether that room will be, the view will be maintained when the room's not in use, or access to that room will it be maintained when it's not in use for a for a big meeting. Um, first thing, uh, the the room seating is movable. It's all, uh, and there's there's a dedicated table and chair storage room to allow flexibility of use of that room. So those seats are not fixed in there. There's also motorized um, shades or screens, both on the interior glass wall and on the outside, so that room can be uh, blackened for a, for a lecture or a, or a slide presentation, but it can also be open uh, when not in use and uh, to allow the light in and allow the views through. So we imagine that'll be flexible. Um, I, it's going to be used quite a bit. I, I, I don't know if that was what you were coming up here to talk about, but certainly the range of activities that are in the room, some might require shades and some might not, but I think you'll see that room being used quite a bit. In our current space, uh, in FY19, we had over 800 meetings and programs. I can't expect we're going to have a lot less than that in the new space, so I don't know that that room will be empty very often, but th this speaks to your question and several that weren't asked. Once we get our approval and once we're moving forward into design development and making our plans, our Board of Library Trustees will want to go over every policy that the library has to make sure that it's not just for the old building, that it makes sense for the new space, for the new needs, for the new ways all the spaces will be used. And we're going to make sure that you know we're maximizing that library space in every way that we can. So I, I don't want to speak to it t t too assuredly right now. Because one, one concern constantly is safety. You know, if we just have a space that's open and not monitored, that's not too safe. But it's going to be all glass windows, so uh, gl glass walls. So I'm pretty sure we'll find a way to make sure that that room isn't being, uh, you know, sitting unused too often. Yeah, important to note too that abo above it, all the all the quiet study rooms, which will <coughs> arguably get more usage, you know, all together over the course of the year than that big one. Those all have that view as well too. So it's not that's not the only space that benefits from that view. But okay. Yeah, a question about um, whether whether there are cozy spaces um, that we might have in this new library, and it's it's a good it's a very good question, and I'm and to be honest with you, I'm not sure we have enough of them built into this design quite yet. It's again schematic design. There's room for for malleability and adjustment. Um, we've done three libraries, including East Ham, with fireplaces in them where the, the, and they and and they usually are associated with a little nook, like a little ingle nook. That's a, off the beat, off a little bit the beaten path, off the big spaces, and one of them is right off of in, in situate is right off of a very big dynamic space, not unlike what we have in this proposal. So I think there's room for that. Um, we sort of see the end of that adult area as a kind of quiet, cozier area, but um, but I think you know coziness has to do with ceiling height too, and uh, it, you know creating nooks, and I th I think there's room for that in this design to do that. But no fireplace. Time for two or three more okay, questions. Okay, time for two or three more questions. The gentleman in the back. Um, with, the, with the new high school being built, is there any collaboration between that library, this library, as far as repetitive um, you know, uh, <coughs> things? Or it just seems like we have two new libraries. So it's how 
You can never have too many libraries. Um, but yeah, there's been, fair enough. Yeah, the question was, um, is there any collaboration between the, the project here and with the high school project, specifically with the new library being built in the new high school? And the answer is yes. Um, we're collaborating at all levels. So I know that our, our chair, Claire Colburn, has had meetings with the chair of the high school building committee, Bill Lavallo. I've had many meetings with uh, John Phelan and with uh, some of the principals. My staff, my staff work with the staff of the school department uh, constantly. We go there as often as we can. And they, help, they helped us advertise for this night here tonight. So. Uh, yeah, we certainly collaborate and, and we try to make sure that they know all the ways that they can benefit from the dollars spent at the library. All right, one more question. Uh, it's about the funding. Has any thought been given to coordinating the need for an override for the library with the, uh, we are told, <laughs> need for another operating um, override very soon in So, Kathy Cohen, Chair of the Library Trustees and member of the Building Committee. So no, that we're on two different timelines. So we've looked at our timeline for the library is, is very prudent to look at what's the timeline that we need for fundraising. And then also I'll say as a trustee, we need a date certain. As we said, as Claire showed at the beginning, we're at end of life in terms of the core infrastructure of this building. We want to avoid at all costs being forced to spend two or three million dollars on a building that we know we wish to replace, we will replace because it's not meeting our needs. So um, I think the operating override is something that the town is looking at. Um, we are very mindful of the burden on the taxpayers, which is why we're looking at alternative funding sources and, and uh, optimistic with all the work that the uh, Belmont Foundation can do. Thank you all. I don't know. Uh do you want to wrap up or say anything? Thank you so much for coming out, for, for your interest, for your input, and, uh, and your, yeah, your input in this process. Thank you. Yeah.